Dr. John Bidmar is a deacon of the Archdiocese of Chicago, assigned to the Slovenian Catholic Mission Center in Lamont, Illinois. He currently directs the Baraga St. Mary's Retreat House in Lamont, Illinois. For most of his professional career, he was a social scientist managing a division of a multinational marketing research firm. He was an academic researcher at the University of Illinois, where he received his PhD. He is currently the Honorary Consul for the Republic of Slovenia for Chicago. He is the Vice President of the Bishop Berga Association Advisory Board. Hello, my name is Deacon John Vidmar. I'm the Permanent Deacon at the Slovenian Catholic Mission in Lamont, Illinois. Our patron is Blessed Anton Martin Slomšek, who is a contemporary of Bodega and also very prolific in writing. What's common between these two men is they both understood the value of what it means to be able to pray in the language of your own tongue. The mission is located on the grounds of the Slovenian Franciscan Fathers in Lamont, Illinois. Uh, that mission is also contained in the same building where we have the Shrine of Maria Pomagai, which is the Mary Help of Christians. Our Franciscan Fathers administer the original shrine in Brezia, Slovenia, and for this reason, this is known as the Mariška Brezia, the American Brezia. I've also served as the director of the retreat house here on the property for the last three years with the passing of Father Blaise uh, Chimajar. This retreat house was originally named for Baraga. It was called the Baraga Guest House or Baraga Dom in Slovenian. And what occurred through time is it expanded its, uh, the ministries that it served to Curcio and marriage encounters and high school retreats and uh, Alcoholics Anonymous retreats People who came here were used to seeing the name St. Mary's Monastery on the front, and, and what they started doing is calling the St. Mary's Retreat House. So when we went to take out Facebook pages, as well as websites, we discovered that there's another St. Mary's Retreat House run by the Dominican Sisters outside of Detroit. So to distinguish them from us, we decided to adapt the historical name to the contemporary usage, and we call this the Baraga St. Mary's Retreat House. In fact, I'm sitting before the bust, the plaque of uh, Bishop Bodega, which was placed into the dining room of the retreat house in 1949 when it opened. And I'm going to move a little bit to my right so that you can see it. Bishop Bodega has been an inspiration to thousands and thousands of retreatants who have come through the store. And I always enjoy telling people who ask, who is this bishop? Um, his history and what he means to the American Catholic Church in the upper Midwest. Finally, I'm also the vice president of the advisory board for the Bishop Barga Association to Bishop John Dorfler, who's the 13th bishop or the 12th successor to Bishop Barga. What am I going to talk about today? Well, what I'd like to do is talk about how the Bishop Barga Association began there's all kinds of confusion. When I first came to Chicago to go to graduate school, I became active at St. Stephen's, and many people at St. Stephen's claimed the society started here. And as I got more involved with the Franciscans in Lamont and some of the history that's written up and documented in the, the religious Slovenian monthly magazine, Ave Maria, there's a lot of claim that the association actually started out here in Lamont, up somewhere near where the current monastery uh, is built. So what is it? Was it started at St. Stephen's in Pilsen or was it started in the monastery in Lamont? I'm going to let you decide after you listen to this presentation. COVID stopped the 90th anniversary celebration of the first Barga days. We were hoping to have it here because this is, whether it was St. Stephen's or whether it was here, this was a critical place for the beginning of the society for the support that the Slovenian Franciscans have always given to the cause. And one of the reasons they always gave to the cause is that one of their own men, Pater Oton Skola, was a Barga missionary who, after years of service in the UP, returned to in his older age years to Slovenia and then died there. But when he went back, he continued to proselytize about the holiness of the, of the bishop the first bishop of Marquette. Father Bernard Ambrosic, who was in 1930, the first part of it, still the pastor of St. John Vianney, the Slovenian parish in Detroit, 
came to Chicago and celebrated one of the three masses that occurred during Bodega days. And what he did is he preached on how Bodega embraced media to be able to evangelize. In fact, he said if Bodega was, was still around today, what he would do is probably buy his own printing press and start his own publishing house. Well, this year we're forced to embrace it, and we think this actually is a good time for us to learn to follow Bodega's example, to use the tools that God has given us, to use the internet to be able to evangelize in our own time. If you want to know how the Bodega Association began, you have to start with a name that most people don't think of, and that's Anton Gordina, probably one of the most successful Slovenian immigrant businessmen in the history of the United States. In Cleveland, where he emigrated to and where I grew up in the St. Vitus Parish, he was a legend. This, he started a furniture store, he had a bowling alley, he had a funeral home, he had an ambulance service, and he was known among the people for being the go-to guide if, if you had problems with the police or the political officials. He helped countless Slovenian immigrants find food, clothing, and shelter and their first job in America. He eventually became the president of KSKJ, and part of this is due to the fact that he is one of the critical factors during the, the World War I era to help KSKJ come out of its financial uh, uh, you might call uneasiness and become finally stable by about 1920. Gurdina had been pushing in publications, the ones controlled by the KSKJ itself as well as other Slovenian pu publications, that there be a Slovenian Catholic Congress in the near future. And he was anticipating three things and he was hoping to do this in 1929. And the first hope was one because of his role as president of KSKJ, he was hoping to celebrate the 35th anniversary of KSKJ in a big way. Second, he was anticipating the 100th anniversary of Bishop Bodega stepping down off a ship in Manhattan and starting his missionary work in America. And he felt that some sort of a large gathering of people from all the Slovenian communities across the United States would help instigate in all of these communities an effort to celebrate this 100th anniversary in a grand style, in a public style, which is so important uh, today. We don't have enough displays of public religion in our lives. And finally, there was anticipation that the Pope was going to declare a jubilee year in 1929. So Gradina was pushing for the idea that something occur in 1929, first to celebrate KSKJ's anniversary, and then prepare the communities for 1930, the 100th anniversary of Bodega stepping into the, mere, the shores of America. Well, in 1928, very, very uh, fortunately, Edinost, which was a newspaper that had been purchased by Father Casimir Zakrysik after he, he became the pastor of St. Stephen's in Chicago, it was a secular paper and it had annual shareholder meetings. And in preparation for the shareholder meetings, some of the people who were shareholders and officers of Adinost decided that perhaps it was a good time to bring in some of the people, especially Antoine Gordina, to talk about the possibility of having an all-Catholic conference. So they invited Antoine Gordina, but they also invited uh, Monsignor John Ullman, who was the pastor of St. Lawrence's in Cleveland, uh, St. Lawrence is in Newburgh Heights, which is in the southern suburbs of Cleveland. But what's critical about Father Ullman is that Father Ullman came from the famous Ullman family in Brockway, Minnesota, which generated many religious vo vocations. Father Ullman himself was a late vocation. Um, in those days, if you went to the seminary, you had to pay your own way. And so he worked doing hard physical labor to earn enough money to be able to pay for his seminary training. So he was critically connected to the Slovenian communities in Minnesota, as well as the Slovenian communities in Cleveland. And the third critical person that was invited to this event was Father Tsverchko, who was a spiritual director of KSKJ during those years. So what happened? Adinost had its regular shareholder meeting and then it adjourned. 
and after it adjourned, it invited these three men, as well as many others, into a general meeting to talk about the possibility of holding an all Slovenian Catholic Congress sometime in the near future. Anton Gardina had presented his goals ahead of time. People were very familiar with it, and they quickly embraced those as a critical factors in terms of what they wanted to accomplish at the Congress, it, it, hopefully in the following year. They also decided to invite for participation people, women, and officers from the newly organized Slovenian Women's Union of America. And finally, what they decided to do before they moved too far forward, they decided to send out notes, communications to all the Slovenian communities across the United States in order to judge and to assess interest in such an effort. They were surprised. Quickly, Branch 50 KSKJ in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, not only said that they were interested, they already started to organize for whenever this would be held. Second, they heard from the Slovenian Women's Union branch in LaSalle, Illinois, that they also not were just interested, but they were starting to organize. They then heard from New Duluth, Minnesota, and from Cleveland, and Detroit, and Bradley, Illinois, Kansas City, South Chicago, Aurora, Illinois, Waukegan, and Milwaukee. And so finally, they decided to have another organizing meeting on Bila, Bili Pundilic, which is the Monday of uh, following White Sunday, which was April 8th, 1929. At that time, they also received word that Cardinal Mundelein had personally given his permission to hold this Congress under his auspices. Doesn't surprise me. Cardinal Mundelein had known Father Kazimierz Zakrajczyk, the founder of the Commissariat of the Holy Cross here in the United States, from their days together in Brooklyn when Mundelein was an auxiliary bishop and Father Zakrajczyk was the pastor of a Slovak parish that was in that area. So they moved forward. And the response wasn't just in the hundreds, it was in the thousands. The final estimate of participants that they had was 12,000 people participated in the three-day event, which started on Saturday, July 6th. The first events that were held were held in downtown Chicago. One of the critical factors that they wanted to emphasize with people was that the youth were the future of the community. So what they did is they invited two different athletic organizations to participate in this Congress. One was the Orals from Cleveland. Most of us are familiar with the Czech Sokol movement, which also had found its way into other Eastern European countries, as well as the Slovenians. The Czechs, these were the Falcons, it was a gymnastic organization. It was to make sure you had a sound mind and a sound body. But this organization was not that it was agnostic. It had no interaction at all with any kind of religious organization. And what the church feared is that youth would be attracted away from church activities. And so they started a competing organization called the Orals, the, the Eagles. And this organization migrated from Slovenia to the United States in the late 1920s. I'm familiar with the Orals. My own grandfather and my mother were member of the Orals back in Slovenia in the late 1920s. The Orals were organized by Father Matija Jagar, who was an assistant at St. Vitus at the time. He later on went on, became the long-term pastor of St. Mary's in, in, uh, in Collinwood. So Father Jagar talked about it, but not only that, what they did is they organized a large uh, gymnastic exhibition of the Orals in the Czech Auditorium at 18th and Ashland in downtown Chicago. That has a capacity of 1,500 people, and it was filled. Every single seat was taken. At the same time, in Lamont, there was a candlelight procession that included over 2,000 people. Father Odilo Heinschik, who is a Franciscan, who in his time, in his missionary time here in the United States, never had a real assignment. His assignment was actually to visit Slovenian communities to help preach, hold retreats, participate in 40 hour um, um, days of adoration. And he also made sure that in communities that where there was no Slovenian priest available, he could at least get there so that people could go to confession once a year. Father Odilo that evening preached on the specialness of the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
Father Schaus from Shakopee, Minnesota preached in English at the same time. Father Schaus is a person, for those of us who are familiar with the history of KSKJ, when he was ordained a deacon that very first year of being a clergy, he was very active in helping to organize and push for the, for the beginning of KSKJ in 1894. There were so many people who were part of this three-day Congress that on Sunday morning, there were three masses. The first mass was held at St. Stephen's in Pilsen in Chicago, not far from that exhibition at 18th and Ashland. St. Stephen's was over on 22nd place near Damon. Father Bernard Mbrozic, who at that time was still the pastor of St. John Vianney, the Slovenia parish in Detroit, was the principal celebrant of the mass. And the church choir from St. John Vianney sang for the mass. Meantime, almost at the same time at St. Joe's in Joliet, they celebrated the 35th anniversary of the institution of this organization. The, it started with a, a very large procession which began in downtown Joliet, came down Chicago Avenue and went into the church and included two floats which KSKJ had sponsored. Father Tsverchko, the spiritual director of KSKJ, was a principal celebrant of the Mass, and he was assisted by the pastor at St. Joe's, uh, Father Batala, who became eventually Monsignor Batala, as well as Father Wenzel Scholar, so who was a, a well-known Benedictine at St. Bede's Academy in Peru, Illinois, which is at, it now is just about an hour and a half down away from, uh, from Joliet. And the homily was given at that Mass by Father Cyril Zupan, who was a Benedictine from uh, Canyon City, uh, who was the longtime pastor of, of Our Lady, Our Mary Help of Christians in Pueblo. He was the oldest living spiritual director of KSKJ, and he was given the privilege of preaching at that Mass. Same time in Lamont, Monsignor Ugolin from St. Paul held a solemn mass and he was assisted by Father Bennigan Snoy, another Franciscan here in Lamont, as well as Father Dominic. This is very critical. We often forget that this province of, or this custody uh, commissariat of Franciscans was started as a combination of Slovenians, Croatians, and Slovaks. Father Dominic, who was Slovak, who had been trained here in Lamont, who eventually made, became part of the teaching faculty of Lamont, was Slovak. He had served in a couple Slovenian parishes, but when the Slovaks decided to create a separate Franciscan province here in the United States, he was named the first provincial. He came back to assist at, at this mass in Lamont celebrating um, uh, the beginning of the Sunday festivities for the Congress, the All Slovenian Catholic Congress. Father Benigan Hugo Bren, who's written written many articles on Badaga and Ave Maria, preached on the ministry of St. Cyril and Methodius. Some people might think that this is strange. Why would he preach at Cyril and Methodius at a celebration which is meant to emphasize the meaning of Badaga in our lives? But Father, Father Hugo understood something critical about, about Badaga's ministry, which linked him back into, to these two apostles who evangelized to the Slavs. And that was that Cyril and Method were very, had grown up in an area of Greece, which was close to Macedonia, and they had, we believe, a Slavic mother. And these people grew up, these two men grew up speaking not just Greek, but also a version of a Slav language. And they realized that virtually no materials existed for the Slavs to, to be able to pray, to be able to participate in liturgy, to be able to read the scriptures. And they spent their whole lives evangelizing the Slavs and producing these kind of materials that became so critical. Uh, in fact, most people don't realize, but Slovenians had until modern times the right to say the to to be able to celebrate mass in a Slavic language. It was a privilege that was often denied by some of the bishops we had who were German to denied this part of the right that had existed from the 800s. After these masses in Joliet and as well as, as in uh, Chicago, there were large processions, long processions of cars and trucks that brought these thousands of people to the hill in Lamont. 
As I said before, by the time these cars parked up Main Street in each direction for probably miles, we had 12,000 people located up on the hill. They used four amplifiers to be able to make sure that everybody could hear the proceedings. People had come from Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Missouri, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and as well as California. In the afternoon, it's interesting, uh, Father Bennigan Snoy, who was uh, in his last year of being the commissar for this particular custody, the commissary of the Holy Cross, was brilliant in terms of how he brought all of these people to attention. He started out in Minochita, in Sina, in Svetiga Duha, Amen. So he started with prayer. And I remember one time my pastor, when the church was very loud before Mass, he said, Go out and say a decade of the rosary. And I stepped up to the ambo and did the same thing. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and started and there was immediate silence. Father Benning and Snoy managed to silence 12,000 people just by saying the, making the sign of the cross. As soon as he was done with his opening prayer, he turned the proceedings over to Father Ullman, the president of the Congress. Father Ullman then invited the Yugoslav ambassador who had come to the, from Washington, D.C. to greet the crowds, as well as the Yugoslav council from here in Chicago. After that, they read greetings from Cardinal Mundelein, as well as Shkof Jeglic from Ljubljana. And then the most senior bishop of the Serbian Orthodox Church came forward to the podium and extended a blessing as well as greetings uh, for the success of this Congress. Local politicians, the mayor, the congressman who covered this area in Joliet, as well as state representatives also stepped forward to greet the crowd and welcome them to this area. This was broken up then by, by a couple of athletic events. The Cleveland Orioles did some gymnastic exhibitions. And then two, meanwhile, two baseball teams, one from Chicago and one from Joliet, sponsored by KSKJ, played a baseball game. And to the chagrin of the Chicago people, the Joliet people won. Their team came forward. This was purposely done in order to emphasize to the people how much it meant to be able to engage our youth in healthy activities to keep them associated with our particular parishes and our particular Catholic organizations and not to isolate them away, um, away from current things. Immediately after that, then Father Schaus from Minnesota stepped forward and that was his message. The youth is our future. And then he spoke to the parents about what their responsibilities are to bring up these children as good Christians. Father Yager then did a summary of the success and how they started the oral program at St. Vitus in Cleveland. And then Father Schaus stepped forward again for the critical part of the proceedings in the afternoon. And that was to lead the discussion on the resolutions that had been prepared by the board to be presented to the crowd uh, for their discussion and ultimately approval. I won't go into all the resolutions. There were many, and a lot of these had to do with the place of parents in society, the place of church in society. But the ninth resolution was the most critical for what we're talking about today. And that was a petition to the Bishop of Marquette to begin a canonization process. Let me read that ninth resolution. The All Slovenian Catholic Congress gathered in anticipation of the 100th anniversary of the arrival of the first Slovenian missionary, Friedrich Baraga, who died in holiness. Heartfully feels that as soon as possible, action should be initiated to have him pronounced blessed. For this purpose, the main board of the All Catholic Slovenian Congress requests the Bishop of Marquette to take the necessary actions. That resolution was overwhelmingly supported by 12,000 people in attendance that day. After there were some more talks, and towards the end of the evening, Pater Rodi Lohainschek stepped forward and gave a short homily to end the afternoon's proceedings, and he ended it with prayer. That wasn't the end of the Congress. On Monday, people gathered back on the hill 
for a solemn requiem mass that was said for all Slovenian immigrants and their descendants who had passed away so far from the homeland and who were buried in their adopted country. The Congress came to a formal end after this mass. But that wasn't the end of the Congress. In reality, there were some outcomes that had to be dealt with. The first one was a decision to hold the Ses Slovensko Romania, that is the All Slovenian Pilgrimage, every year. And they decided to do this in Lamont on the weekend, which is closest to the July 4th weekend. That practice continued till about 10 years ago. There is also, the people came together before they left, agreement to help each other in organizing various Baraghe days in all the different communities. And it was amazing. They got commitments from people in Eveleth, here in Lamont, Marquette, Calumet, as well as Eagle Harbor, Steelton, Pennsylvania, Willard, Wisconsin, which gathered together the people from West Dallas, Milwaukee, and Sheboygan. And the people in Cleveland agreed to turn their annual mass at their Lord's Grotto into a Badaga event. And then finally, they agreed that the last event of the year would be held on New Year's Eve in 1930 at St. Cyril's in Manhattan, which was only a few short miles where Badaga stepped foot onto the shores of America in 1830. And they also had the decision on who to deliver, who was to deliver the resolution to the Bishop of Marquette. Pater Bernard Mbrosic, the, who is the about to become the, the head of this commissariat was appointed and he personally went up to Marquette and he was joined by Monsignor Rizek from St. Ignatius of Calumet and they had a personal audience with the bishop to present the resolution and they received approval that, that the organization should begin. In some ways, we can argue that it was St. Stephen's where this began. We can argue that it was Anton Gradina pushing for an all Catholic conference. We can claim that it began with the passing of resolution here in Lamont on that Sunday, uh, July 8th. You could also claim it's when the bishop gave his assent in Marquette on uh, when Father Bernard and Monsignor Rizek went to see him. So, what helped the memory of Bishop Barga continue? I'd like to say that the Bishop Barga Society actually began in the hearts and minds of the people he served, first in Slovenia and also the Native Americans in the upper Midwest. They were critical for holding his memory alive with the personal stories they had of his holiness, of his evangelization. The second thing that kept his memory alive was his own writings. If you take a look at Dushna Pasha, which Dr. Maria Arco Clements translated last year and we published last summer, that publication, first published in 1830, was last published in 1905. There were something like 13 different printings of that. Our Franciscans here in Lamont continued to sell copies of Dushna Pasha into the 1920s to Slovenian Americans in the United States. My own mother in the 1930s in Predosla, Slovenia, was used that prayer book in family prayer. This prayer book that he wrote had a tremendous amount of meaning to Slovenians for generations. The Indians also kept alive and passed from generation to generation the materials that were published in their own tongue. Finally, we have material that was published by others. We turn to Father Christosus Verstwist, who published the first, was a Franciscan who served mostly in Wisconsin, who published the first biography of the good bishop, somewhere around the period of 1900. Monsignor Anton Rizek, as a young priest, published the second biography, which was part of the book the History of the Sault Ste. Marie and Marquette Diocese. That book was reprinted about 15 years ago and is still available for purchase. Later on, people like Joseph Gregorich and Bernard Lambert and Father Ziegler in Toronto in Slovenia were critical for taking on, after the Bodega Association was running, to continue his memory going 
in more contemporary accounts of his life. I'd like to end with two thoughts. The first is something that my grandfather said to me when he took me on my first Badaga days. And we were up towards, this is near Goodhart, and we met an old Indian whose parents had been baptized by Badaga. And he said Badaga was a true Slovenian. And what he meant by that was he passed on the faith that was given to him to others. The second thing I want to pa pass along, I want to end with, is that my favorite picture of the good bishop is not the one of a vibrant young man, but it's the picture of the old man hunched over with a leathery face. In his missionary work, he lived with his people. He became a part of his people. It's a lesson that is still relevant today. Thank you. And God bless you.